Hammonds. I'm the director for Jewish Life at Duke. Welcome to the Freeman Center. Um, we're absolutely thrilled that you guys can be here tonight, and uh, I'm not going to stand in the way between you and our um, event, but as you know, uh, Coach John Shiner is here to talk with us, and I'm going to actually turn it over to Zach Spira, who's going to be asking the questions. And so Zach's going to ask some questions, and Coach Shiner's going to answer, and then there's going to be time for your questions and answers as well, and then afterwards there's going to be some food outside. So thank you guys for coming, and here we go. All right, thank you guys for coming. Uh, we'll start at the beginning. Uh, so where'd you grow up? Well, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for coming. This is uh, exciting for me to be here, speak to you guys, and hopefully I have a little bit of wisdom. You know, I went here and now I'm back here coaching. So thank you. I feel like we're on a talk show. Like this would be you know, set up at Allen or something like that. But hopefully we can be entertained. But anyway, start over and let's, uh, let's do it. Where'd you grow up? All right. <laughs> I, uh, I grew up right outside Chicago, suburbs of Chicago, a town called Northbrook, and we went to a school called, called uh, Clover North. Yeah, uh, can you talk a little bit about your family? Yeah, my family, I have uh, uh, my mom and dad, uh, both grew up in Chicago, I have two, two older sisters, um, Jennifer and Brooke. Jennifer went to Michigan, uh, Brooke went to Texas, and uh, my older sister now has a niece and a nephew, so I'm a proud uncle. But uh, that, that's my family. Did you have any form of Jewish education growing up? I did. I did. I went to a few years of, of Hebrew school and uh, before uh, sports took over a little bit too much for me. But uh, a few years of Hebrew school and then uh, a lot of tutoring before my bar mitzvah. So that's, that's the main, uh, main education. Yeah, what was your bar mitzvah like? My bar mitzvah, I remember the, this is taking me back now, the theme of my bar mitzvah was Jonathan in the zone. And uh, <laughs> so I remember that was my theme. And it had to do with sports, and it had to do with, uh, you know, basketball, of course, but Jonathan in the zone. And uh, had to tie it in some It's pretty good, right? <laughs> like, uh, what was your, your high school basketball experience like? My high school basketball experience was great. You know, it's actually funny. Um, you know, people, uh, I played varsity as a freshman, went down state my freshman year in, in Illinois. I don't know, is anybody here from Illinois? By any okay, where from? Deerfield. All right, all right. <laughs> Aiden Hall is Deerfield, just so you know. Is Aiden Hall? Well, play in high school. All right, there we go. <laughs> so, so you can back me up if, if anybody thinks I'm lying, you can set them straight and I'm telling the truth. All right, thank you. Um, so for me, uh, I played varsity as a freshman, and my, my school that I went to, Lumber North, we had never been to the Final Four at Illinois, in Illinois before. And at that time, I hate to say at that time, I'm getting old, but there's only two classes in Illinois, and now there's four. Every state has all these classes. But for us, basically any team that had more than five, 600 kids was in our class. There were a lot of teams there. We finished third in state, and in the semifinals, uh, I was guardian guy, we were up by two with about 10 seconds left. And a guy hit a three with a hand in my, what, I had a hand in his face. And they scored, they won the state, they went to the state championship. And then we were able to get back there my junior year. We won, and uh, everybody joked about it afterwards because it was the first school ever to win with five Jewish starters. And, and our sixth man was a Muslim kid coming off the bench. So we <laughs> That definitely hasn't happened before. So it's a pretty unique team from that standpoint. But uh, proud, proud of what you guys do. Yeah. Um, so why did you choose Duke? I'm sure you got a lot of options. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Duke was a special place. I'm sure all of you guys have you know had many choices. You know, with, because you want to be here if you weren't talented in some different area. And for me, Duke was special for one. It was Coach K. You know, Coach K meant, meant a great deal to me, the type of person he is and the relationship we had built. You know, I was started, I started to get recruited by Duke as a sophomore. And so we were able to build up a great relationship. By the time I was at the end of my junior year, I knew the decision was to come to Duke. I looked at uh, my final list of schools, I had a variety. Um, the, my high school coach, uh, his brother was a head coach at Illinois at the time. Bruce Weber, and now he's Bruce Weber, I don't know if you guys know who that is. He's now the head coach at Kansas State, but at the time, the fact that my coach was his brother, 
there was, you know, I felt a pretty good amount of pressure to go there. And uh, but at the end of the day, Duke was uh, the most special place for me. Um, so forgetting basketball for a second, what were your greatest memories being at Duke? At the end of the day? You know, that's a good question. That's very <laughs> stumpy. <laughs> I, uh, you know, my favorite memories of being at Duke really, of course, you have moments on the court that I played in that were really good. But there's the times off the floor I remember the most, and you know. Being around college people now, college, you know, our guys, I'm around every day coaching them. But the, the you only have opportunities once you leave college to be close to to people like you guys have the opportunity to be on an everyday basis. And so I think I miss that interaction. Um, whether it's just spending time with friends off the court, or for, for me with basketball, I remember our practices sometimes. Actually, I remember our toughest practices more than anything. The times where you're tested, you need to come together as a group. So that's what I miss the most, uh, being here at Duke. Yeah, um, so as a player. Yeah, as a player. <laughs> so you were a student athlete. Uh, what did you major? History. history. Yeah, history major, uh, specializing in uh, uh, United States history. But uh, yeah. Okay, uh, do you have like a favorite class that you remember the most? Yeah, I took a, I don't know if they offered the class still, so I took a, a modern warfare class about, uh, specifically about World War II. And it was actually, uh, for me in history, that was, that's, I've always been fascinated by that area. Of course, you have the Holocaust and everything that happened, you know, with that. Um, but just the entire, it, it really, the class, the course took us through basically the strategic aspect behind World War II and what Germany was trying to do, and obviously a lot of other people had agendas too. Yeah. Um, so, I'm sure you all know you have a national champion as a player and a coach, but as a player and a uh, peer. What made that 2010 team so special and so different? Yeah, well, I think we got our butts kicked my first two years, which, in, in, in all seriousness, I think that helped us because, uh, you know, we won in my senior year, and I feel fortunate. Not many people can say they won their last game in college because, you know, only one team gets to do that. Um, but for me, you know, we went 22 and 11 in my freshman year. And I think, I think when you come to Duke, I think there's an expectation, whether you're a student or a player, that Duke's just going to win. Duke basketball is just going to win. I think there's, I, I think it's easy to fall into that when you realize you win because of the work you put in. You don't win just because you're at Duke. And so my freshman year, we, we, we lost, we had two four game losing streaks. We were uh, 18 and three, top 10 team in the country. And we lost a heartbreaker in overtime at Virginia. We ended up losing four games in a row. We won four games in a row and then to close out the season, we lost four games in a row. We lost in the first round of ECU. Uh, I always wanted to be one, you know, one shiny moment. One shiny moment, okay. I always want to be in that as a kid. That was a dream of mine. That's for anybody who doesn't know, one shining moment is the song that comes on at the end of every uh, NCAA March Madness tournament, and they you know play the music, blue the banjos, and you know anyway. Um, my first time on it was having a kid hit a game winning shot over me as a freshman. VCU hit a shot with about a second, one point eight seconds, and I. I Play pretty good D or whatever, but he hit the shot. So that was my first time in one shining moment. So, <laughs> yeah, not exactly how I thought it would go. And so it killed me. And I think for all of us, we felt that pain. The next year we come back, we lose in the second round, we get upset to West Virginia. My third year we lose in the Sweet 16 to Villanova. We get blown out by, we were, we were losing by 25 points at one, at one time in that game. And so I felt like we were tough. That's what I'm, Getting to. We were a tough team, we played together. So when it came time, we played two road games. My senior year, we played two road games in the tournament. And when I say road games, obviously we didn't play on someone else's home floor. But we played Baylor in Houston, and there were about 45,000 people there. I would say three quarters of them were for Baylor. And then we played uh, Butler in Indianapolis. And um, even Besides the Butler fans, uh, the rest of the people there were rooting for Butler. They weren't rooting for Duke, I promise you that. So we were tough to overcome that as a special group.
Uh, can you describe that moment? Yeah, well for, well for me, my year, uh, we're, we're, it's a pretty hectic game, you know, we're up by one, and we, we actually, we missed a couple easy layups that we usually make. We're up by five with two minutes left to cut it to one. We had a, we had a chance to go up to, up to three, and uh, we missed a shot, and they come down, and everybody talks about, you know, the kid Gordon Hayward had a half-court shot to, to beat us. There's a shot he had before that from the baseline. And I was right under the basket, like if, if Zach was shooting, you know, and the basket was here, I was right under the basket. And I, I thought it was going in for sure. And he missed it. Brian Zubek gets a rebound, he goes to the free throw line. He makes the first free throw, which was great. You know, he was, uh... <laughs> 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 I confidence in him. <laughs> Don't put words in my mouth. Uh, but, uh, he makes the first free throw, and then all of a sudden, coach, is on the sideline telling, telling him to miss the free throw. And it's really loud in there. And then coach, there's some confusion whether some of the other coaches were saying to make it. So that way, if you are three, there's no way you can lose. But regardless of what was told, he misses the, he misses the free throw. And Hayward comes down, takes the half-court shot. I thought there was a chance, but I, I did not think it was going in. And uh, at that point, it was just the way we won. It was um, just pure, pure joy. I would say pure joy. Pure joy. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that in comparison to this past season? How that may have been similar or different? Yeah, you know, I think if you were to ask me after we won in 2010, if there would ever be a, a feeling as good uh, winning as a player, then I probably would have said no way. I was more excited this year than I was as a coach than I was as a player. And I think the reason that is is because, it, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it's great to get a gift, but when you give someone a good gift, it's even better. You know, you're looking like you've never given someone a gift before. <laughs> I'm just, um, but for me, you know, working with the guys and seeing them go through that moment, seeing Tyus Jones in the championship game, you know, that morning I'll go working on coming off ball screens because they don't, you know, they don't step in. The, the, the big guy doesn't help a lot on the ball screen until we're practicing that shot. And then all of a sudden he's, we're in the game, it's a close game, and he does that four or five times. And he's MVP, cover Sports Illustrated, national champion. And uh, you, you feel so much excitement for him, for, for the team. I'm just using Tyson as, as an example. So for this year it was, um, it was pretty cool because the way my team did it was the exact opposite of the way this team did it. You know, we were a young team, kind of, uh, you know, the moment didn't, didn't get to us. You know, our championship game this year, I don't know if you guys know this, was the most watched game since the 98 finals where Michael Jordan did a shot, and which is pretty, pretty incredible uh, testament to these guys and the level that they played at. So after you graduated, you played in professional league Israel for a little while. Um, how did your Jewish identity play any role in that decision that did it all? Yeah, well, I, you know, a dream of mine was always playing in the NBA, and I came out. Uh, I was, you know, excited after you know we won the national championship. I was the leading scorer that the team had assist that year, and I felt like there was a place for me on an NBA team. And during the draft process, I got mono. And I was skinny to begin with. I lost 20 pounds during that process. You know, I was maybe you know 169. Pounds. I mean, really, I lost so much weight, and uh, that set me back for the for the draft. I, I did not get drafted, and I signed on uh, for summer league to play, play with the Miami Heat. Who at that time signed signed a guy named LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> I signed another guy named Chris Bosh, and they re-signed Dwayne Wade. And they had one other guy signed on the team, so there were there were uh, there was four guys. There were eleven roster spots available, and so right away I knew there was a spot I wanted to go. First game in summer league, I uh, playing for the Heat. I actually hit the game winning shot. I thought I played really well. I felt good about my chances. And the second game, I got hit in the eye, and as soon as I got hit, I felt like a, a amazing shock in my whole body. And I covered my eye and went back in the training room. I, there was a lot of blood. I went back in the training room and the doctor asked me to open my eye and tell him what I could see. And I couldn't see anything. And it was completely blind. 
And at that point, I knew something was not right. And I was, they rushed me to the hospital. And long story short, I had a, a severed my optic nerve in my right eye, which, uh, for I'm sure you guys know, for a nerve, you can't get that back. There's nothing you can get back. And so later that night, I regained a little vision. Uh, the bottom half of my eye, I can see out of it partly, and my top half is still completely blind. And I don't think I ever, you know, to be honest, I, I don't think I've ever said this before, but I don't think I ever fully recovered as a player. I don't think, I think as a player, mentally is as big as, your mental edge is as big as it is for a physical edge, especially for me. Look, I'm not the most athletic guy, I never was, but mentally I was always, I felt a step ahead, I was always confident, sometimes maybe, maybe even cocky, but in, in a good way. And uh, it's a good way, it's cocky in a good way. That's the, that's the thing. Um, but then, so I, I took some time off my first year out, and I ended up, I was out for about six months. The last two months of that year, I went and played in the D League. So I went from playing a national championship in front of 70,000 people. My first game back in the D League, there were about 12 people in the stands. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, about 12 people. But it was a good experience, you know, I thank you. Uh, it's, it's not easy doing that. I was in Rio Grande Valley, which is, I was five minutes from the border of Mexico. And, um, you know, you're taking three flights and a two hour bus ride to get to where you're going to play. And I felt like I got tougher playing in that environment. I played there for two months. And then I signed, to get to your question, I signed uh, to play for Maccabi Tel Aviv in Israel, which was a, an amazing experience. It was my first time in Israel. Has everybody, has been in Israel? Have people, some people, okay. Some people, okay. It's a great place. And especially Tel Aviv is an amazing place. And I was fortunate to live there. I ended up, Having a good experience playing, uh, but at the same time, I didn't play a lot, and that was, that was a hard, hard thing for me. Uh, because of that, I did go there, and uh, I had dual citizenship after going there. So I'm an Israeli citizen as, as well as an American, which I'm, I'm proud to say. Um, so, the, I mean, did your experience playing and living there influence you as you? Yeah, I think it really did. I think, um, I think being in Israel and I was fortunate to meet some some of my closest friends. I have some. I made some amazing friends that still live in Israel, and uh, you know, I, I think the thing that I saw being over there, there's always something going on in the world with Israel, and I think what you see in the news isn't always reality, and I could relate to that being over there, living there, and I, I would get calls from my mom at you know three thirty in the morning and say, "Oh my God, are you okay?" And, you know, it's, it's, everything's good, you know, everything's fun, and uh, that was one of the things that I felt proud to be Jewish, living in, living in Israel, and you realize how uh, there's not a lot of Jews in the world, there's just, there's just not, and so that, that only strengthened my uh, beliefs. Uh, so what was the process like when you decided to come back and come back and be a coach? Yeah, well, the next year after that, I played in a place called Grand Canaria. Canary Islands off the coast. It's in Spain, but it's almost off the coast of Morocco in, in Africa. It's a great place. I was playing, and like I said earlier, I never felt like I was completely back as a player. And I mean, I remember staying up before, you know, Duke was playing Saturday night at 9 o'clock. That meant in, in Spain, uh, they were playing at 4 in the morning. And uh, in Spain, we played Sunday mornings. and which is odd to me. I never got the hang of it. But uh, so we'd be playing 11 a.m. Sunday morning. I'm up, I'm up at 4:30 watching Duke. You know, I'm watching them, and that's where my heart was. And you know, I think part of the reason of playing in Europe and, and as a professional basketball player, for me at least, was I want to make a nice living, and I love playing basketball. But my heart was not in playing in Europe. My heart was in playing in the NBA, playing in college, coaching someday. And I knew I wanted to come back and coach. And so around that time, Chris Collins happened to be leaving to go to Northwestern. So I thought there was a chance I could go to Chicago, where I'm from, and coach with him. And after having one conversation with Coach, uh, he made it very clear he wanted me back here. And that's all it took to know. It's just I want to come back here and coach.
coach. What was the transition like from being a player and a coach in the same program? You know, I think I think it was I think it helped me from the standpoint you know what the expectations are to be a coach here. And I'm sorry to be a player here. So it's easier to coach understanding what coach expects from you, what being a new basketball player is all about. But then also, uh, you know, you walk the walk, so to speak. And so when you're telling a guy something, you're not telling them to do anything, you go defend yourself, which I think that helped me and uh, made the transition easier. The other thing, the other thing that helped was I didn't play, finish my senior year and go right into coaching. I had some years apart. One, to separate myself as a player and as a student. And then also to give me more uh, experience, you know, to see different styles of coaching, different players, and uh, different styles of playing, <coughs> which, which helped me. How is your relationship with Coach K uh, and how has it been different from when you were a player? I think it's totally, uh, totally different. I think, uh, you know, as a player, I don't care how close you are as a player with a coach, it, you're, it's still a coach-player relationship. And now I feel like we're friends. As, as um, crazy as that might sound, I feel like we're friends, we're great friends. And that's something I feel very fortunate to be working for him, with him, and uh, it's it's incredible. What are the, what's the best advice Coach Manning gave you? He's given a lot of a lot of advice. You know, I would say, can I say two things? Is that all right? <laughs> I would say two things. Um, and, and both, of, a lot of coaches' advice has held true for me past playing. And I think, I think two things. One, he uses the term a lot: get outside yourself. And uh, by nature, I think I'm a shy person. Yeah, I think growing up, I wouldn't be the first one to walk into a room and start talking. I would usually wait for someone to come talk to me. That's just my personality. And uh, the way we use it in basketball terms is when you're playing, if you're consumed with, consumed with yourself, and just worrying about you scoring or you making a play instead of your team winning, that's not getting outside of yourself. When really you need to throw yourself into it and worry about your team winning and your team, team and your teammates doing the best they can and naturally you'll come along and do your best. I think that's held true for anything outside of basketball, whether it's in my everyday life. It's been a really good advice. And then the other thing is he always, uh, he doesn't sugarcoat things, but he uh, looks at the reality of the situation. And so he'll always, he would always say to me as a player, okay, well, maybe at Glenn North, uh, you know, when you were playing Deerfield High School and scoring 40 points and not, when you're playing Deerfield and, and you're beating them by a lot, you, you, you keep going back to what you did then. But that's not the case anymore. That's not reality. You need to change. And so being able to look at something the way it really is and uh, to have a, those two things, I would say, are two of the best advice he's, he's given me. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor for any questions from you guys. Hey, Fanny. Yeah. So, I've always I thought it was really cool how the Duke basketball program it really does feel like a family. Um, just seeing all, I mean, right, as you guys have right now, all current four players on staff coaching. Um, and then having guys come back all the time, and you had the Nets in here with Billy King a couple weeks ago. What does it mean to you to really be a part of that family? And what's been the experience? I mean, you've had assistant coaches who were players under Coach Day, you worked with Coach Day. What does it all mean to you? Um, can I ask that one of you guys at least reframe the question or repeat it so that we, people who watch this can hear? Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, well, to answer your question about. Uh, do basketball being such a family. You know, for me, what's cool about it, I don't care what other school you go to, what other schools had their coach there for 36 years. And so, I don't care if it's Jay Billis or Johnny Dawkins who played here in the 80s, or Christian Lehner, or Elton Brand, or Shea Battier, or all these guys that you go up the ladder. We all play for the same coach. And so you have that same bond, and you're a part of it. And the cool part for me, you know, when I was a player here, we had, the three assistant coaches were Johnny Dawkins, who's now the head coach at Stanford, 
Chris Collins, who's now the head coach at Northwestern, and Steve Wojciechowski, who's now the head coach at Marquette. And so the, the coaching family we've built up as well is, is um, just as cool to me as uh, the, the playing family. So that's, it's, it's a fraternity like no other in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So um, going from being a high school player and now you're a coach, um, how has recruiting changed like, from being a kid to courting kids? And then also, um, Duke is, up until like, very recently, we've been pretty proud of having a strong better group of players, especially if yeah. you won a national championship. And now we have kids who are like, one and done. So I guess how does that pitch? Also, yeah. yeah, well, the question was about how does our recruiting change since I was in high school, which was a long time ago and now how, uh, how it is now as a coach. But it's actually a great question because it has changed a lot. In, uh, I'm 28, I was recruited you know, 10, 11 years ago. And when I was a player, you didn't have text messages. So coaches called you, they didn't text you. Now, I think kids would immediately press ignore if you try to call them. But if you text them, they're gonna get back in one second. And I think that's today's age, how it, how it changes. Um, even I think in, in, if, you, if you look at you guys, I'm sure, what's the ratio for texting compared to talking on the phone? And so for us, we're not allowed to text kids until, they're, uh, until June after their sophomore year. And, but once that period happens, you can text them freely. And when I was being recruited, you in your period, so you could call once a week. And so it's much more fre frequent now. You can, it's kind of an everyday thing. So that, that's a lot different from when I was being, being recruited. And then to answer your other question, it has changed because every year our roster changes. You don't, we, like, we can't, if you were a senior now and we're recruiting you, it's hard to really tell you what a roster could be next year. You know, if, if you go back a year ago, is Tyus Jones one and done? Do we know that for sure? Is Justice Winslow, you know, maybe he's one, maybe he's two years. And so trying to predict the future is impossible or near impossible, but also trying to plan for it is, it's a tough thing. Um, but it's exciting because we're able, the kids we're able to coach are special. And, uh, you know, those guys, they did their jobs last year, winning a national championship and leaving after a year, that's fine. We're, we're, we're great with that. But we've shown that we can do that as well as any school. We're, we're a top kid can come here, go to a place like Duke, and then do what's best you know, for him. Yeah. Do you have any um, funny stories or interactions with Coach K as a player or coach that you can share with us? Do I have any uh, funny, quest, uh, funny interactions with coach as a player? Um, yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, you know, for me, was uh, the thing I would have never guessed about coach is how energetic he is. And you know, he's he's not early in his career; he's late in his career, but he still gets as excited as anything. And I remember, you know, so how it works for us before a game. Uh, we'll have an assistant go through the scouting report before the game of the other team. So if we're playing, whoever we're playing, we'll come in about 35 minutes before the game, talk to our team, you know, uh, watch out for this guy who does this, you know, get back on defense, offense, speak is what we're looking to do. And then coach will talk to us, and then we'll come back in again closer to 10 minutes, and we'll go through our matchups, and then coach will come back in and say, talk to us for the final time. So we were playing a game my freshman year, it was a big game, we, we needed to win. And instead of a game plan, with 10 minutes left, all of a sudden the lights turn off in the locker room. And the scene in Braveheart comes on. Where, you know, we're, we're in Braveheart where he's, uh, Mel Gibson's running back and forth, he has his face painted, and then they start yelling, and they go in battle, and they, they win the war, right? He went yelling under the floor, and I think we uh, definitely won that day. <laughs> Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about your relationship with the players being only like eight years older than them and that yeah. doesn't matter how that uh, relationship is? Yeah, you know, I think uh, my relationship with the players because I am younger, I think helps me. I think it, I like that aspect. I, I think one, um, they know I can still get out there at times and show them some things, which, which no, in all seriousness, I think it helps knowing that I can do that. And some of them, 
where I, it's not too long ago where they've watched me a little bit. So I think there's some credibility there I have with guys, and I just think it's proof that any of you have studied, have studied up and know your stuff from a coaching perspective now as well. And so from that aspect, I don't try to be, I'm, I'm old enough where I'm not trying to be one of you guys, I'm not trying to be a college kid anymore, I'm not trying to be one of the guys, I don't need that, but I'm also young where we can, you know, talk about some other things and still be, you know, guy to guy, if that uh, was the case. So, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I think it helps, I try to use that to my advantage. Yeah. Who's your best friend on the team when you were a player? And are you still close to your teammates? Yeah, I was. Uh, we had a really close team. Brian Zubek was my roommate for two years. I was really close with him. We actually became better friends when we did stop living together. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, living in a dorm with a seven-two guy is not very fun. I tell you that much. And you can tell him I said. I know it's being recorded. You can tell him I said that it's fun. Um, and Nolan Smith, you know, and I were really close. Kyle Sandler, Joe Henderson was my roommate. He's, you know, one of my best friends to this day. So we had a we had a really close group. Yeah. Um, what's been the most challenging or um, unexpected aspect of coaching? I think the the amount of behind the scenes stuff that goes on. So the amount of time you spend actually coaching the guys for a college basketball team is. I wish there was more, <laughs> you know, but there's. Running a program and uh, behind the scenes scheduling. All right, uh, on the road, when should the guys eat? Uh, which we have two around. How's this guy doing? And, you know the hours that go into it outside of just coaching the guys on the floor is way more than I could have ever imagined. And uh, but from the same aspect, I, I love it. It's challenging and uh, it's fun to try to figure something out. Yeah. Sure, so you talked a little bit about your recruitment process when you were a uh, junior and senior uh, at GBN, and um, Bruce Weber's brother might have been talking out the one way a little bit, pushing that. But I was wondering what role Chris Collins might have played in sort of pushing you towards yeah. Duke as, as a former GBN yeah. uh, player and as a Duke grandma, obviously. Yeah, well, I went through a stage when I was really young, I always loved Duke. You know, I, I can remember getting um, uh, not a DVD, but a cassette of the 94 uh, Final Four, which was Duke in Grand Hill, and I loved, Grand Hill made that look uh, look cool, where he had the shorts, but then he had the spandex longer than the shorts, I always thought that was a really cool thing, and so I just loved Duke, you know, from that point on, and then I got to a point in junior high, because they were so good, all my friends liked Illinois, liked Illinois. so I decided I, I wasn't going to root for Duke or Illinois. And I found a team in Seton Hall, had a really good team at the time. It's, like, it's random, I know, but I was a big Seton Hall fan. And uh, in eighth grade, I was offered by Marquette. It was my first scholarship offer, and I was very excited at that moment. But I always knew at some point, at some time, Duke would be a pretty cool place. And Chris Collins called me sometime, and Chris Collins went to my high school. He was an assistant, he went to my high school at Homer North. And so the connection we had, I think, was stronger than anything. He understood what I was going through, and he'd always joke with me about being from where I'm from, my town, and you know, are you going to 74 bar mitzvahs this year? And he'd always you know, tease me about it. Um, but uh, that's uh, that had, that had a lot to do with my my reason for wanting to come here. Chris, Chris was. Yeah. Uh, what are your plans for the future? You know, uh, for me, first and foremost, I want to be the best assistant I can. Sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Just, uh, <laughs> but I want to be the best assistant I can here. You know, I coach uh, being able to coach for him is a special thing. I don't take for granted. So I want to be here with him, and I want to win some more national championships. I mean, that's you know, it's I don't underestimate how hard it is, but also that's some that's a goal that we have as staff as a team. And at some point, I'd love to be a head coach. I don't know when there would be, but that's a goal of mine to be a head coach at a at a special place and see what happens. Yeah. So you made a point of saying that you were on a winning high school team where all the players were Jewish. Yes. And um, starters, the starters. Uh, all the starters <laughs> were Jewish. Those, just the people on the court who won the game. <laughs> um, and often you hear about Jewish athletes, Jewish sports hall of fame. What do you 
What's your take on being a Jewish basketball player, and has that had any influence over time? Because we're sitting in a room full of people who are very excited that John Shire was a Jewish basketball player. But too. Yeah, I think for me, you know, I was, um, I remember my junior and senior year here, I won the Jewish you know, National Player of the Year. And, you know, I went to um, one time the Jewish Hall of Fame. And the sports hall of fame, I should say, in New York. And for me, I've always wanted to be recognized as a great basketball player and not a great basketball. I always wanted a kid to look up to me because of one, who I was as a person, and then my basketball skills, and not because I was Jewish. But I figured on top of it, if that was a cool thing, that I am Jewish on top of respecting my game and the way I played and who I was, then I was all for that. And you know, I think as, as a kid, and I can relate to this, you're always looking for someone who's gone through something similar or comes from a similar background or a similar situation. And so I'm, I'm proud that I'm in the minority, so to speak, in a sport where uh, there's not many Jewish basketball players to come through. And I'm proud of that, but I also want to be recognized as a great basketball player, period. And that's been something that's important to me. Yeah. Uh, let's say that Duke had the national championship game on November. Would you play? <laughs> <laughs> I would never turn on a game. So that's uh, I know that's not a good thing to say. <laughs> but it's the truth. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Mojave Derby, and oh. I was wondering how I wanted to play there, and I also wanted to be from playing the states and playing there. Yeah, well, I felt lucky because in Maccabi Tel Aviv, they have the best fans, period, in Europe, maybe anywhere. And so I, I felt lucky to play for the best fans here at Duke, and then to go play there for the best fans, really professionally, anywhere. And for you guys who haven't been there or been to a game, the fans are crazy. Like, they are, they are super passionate. When I arrived at the airport, in, in Tel Aviv, there are about, there are maybe a hundred, if not more, fans <laughs> waiting there and, and serenading me. <laughs> it's, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. And it's, it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible, and it makes you feel so welcome. And the, the difference is, you know, in Europe, they have, in the student section, imagine a camera indoor where the camera crazies, they have drums. They're playing the drums the whole game. And that's what it's like. Uh, playing there, and it's uh, an amazing experience. I mean, it's an amazing experience to play there. Yeah. What do you think are the, the biggest ways you see the Jews' campus change since you're a freshman? Construction. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Is there construction everywhere right now? It's, it's, it's a lot. Um, no, just little things. You know, that where the construction is going on right now at West Campus, I would always go there. That's where the loop used to be. That's where uh, I got my first bad haircut at Duke going in there. <laughs> and, uh, that, that used to be an old salon in there. And uh, just a few little changes like that. Um, I lived in Bassett as a freshman. Um, our, our guys don't live there anymore. Um, that's the main construction. <laughs> yeah. Any, any, any more questions? Yeah. Um, coach Jason Curry sort of had a profound impact on you as a player, so to the point now you're still referring to his coach and you're yeah. working alongside him. I'm just sort of wondering what that relationship like, is now as you're working alongside him. Yeah. Sort of referring to so, do you think if you were working alongside him, would you call him Mike? <laughs> <laughs> this is a sound right here, right? <laughs> um, you know, he's, the, the thing I found is um, the amazing thing about Coach K, here's what's amazing about it, is 10 years coaching the national team. You know, he's been a head coach for over 40 years, five national championships, 12 final fours, and I'm a relatively new coach, 28. He'll listen. Like, he, he listens to his staff. He gives us responsibility. And the fact that he doesn't have, it's not his way. You know, it's, of course, I mean, we're gonna do, trust me, he's the guy putting together the entire plan, but it's not, each year he does not have a set. I'm running this offense, um, going to uh, 
coach these guys, this, this style, or watching film these days, he's very open to change. And that's one of the things that's amazing for me, being able to work with him, where it's not like, it's actually working with him. It's not working for him, which is a pretty cool thing for how much he's accomplished and where he's at in his career. Um, I think Coach Shire has some questions for the audience. Oh yeah, I, I do. So I would love if, uh, I would have, like to ask you guys a question. If someone knows it, I would love to have two tickets to a game sometime. And so let's see, you know, you know, we're talking about that maybe, maybe more. We'll see. But so my 2010 national championship team. Can anybody name the starting five on that team? <laughs> <laughs> you don't count. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yourself, Nolan, uh, Lance Thomas, Zubek, and Kyle Sigler. Wow. Nice to <laughs> Did you know that? that? I did. I was actually at the game. Freshman. <laughs> okay. Did someone else raise her hand? She did. She did. <laughs> <laughs> she did. Did you raise your hand? Yeah, did you? Yeah, was that not the right answer? That was. I was just asking. <laughs> was that what you were going to say? Okay, so for you three, I'll ask one more. Can you name the three other guys that played in that game? Ooh. You don't count. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you got a chance. Mason, formerly Miles, formerly Andre Dolphin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's very good. That's very good. Make sure Rebecca has your info. Okay. Yeah. We'll get you to an ACC game. Okay. Yeah. What's your name? Ethan Bain. Ethan. Okay. Nice to you. Give it up for Ethan. Well, I just want to again thank you guys again for having me, and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys out in some games. But uh, it means a lot for you guys to be here, so thank you very much.